Well, the old saying goes, if that doesn't fire you up, your wood is really wet. <laughs> a couple of weeks back, we celebrated Independence Day. And on July 4th, a day typically marked by expressions of patriotism, barbecue, and fireworks, I can still remember, it's almost 20 years ago now, Lee Greenwood at the Boats Basin. It was right after 9-11, and he had released a song, God Bless the USA. This year, the song, Am I the Only One by Aaron Lewis, was the really big hit in certain circles. For a large portion of our country, and for many of us here in this room this morning, what's going on in our country and around the world has us quite disturbed. And truthfully, for good reason. The only thing currently that all sides can right now agree upon is that we're anything but united. This morning, we will take a look at Psalm 37, another psalm by David, that, like Psalm 3 that John shared last week, was written when David was an older man. As I was sharing with some folks this, a little bit earlier, Psalm 37 is a wisdom psalm. There are many different types of psalms, and this is a wisdom psalm, and if you know anything about wisdom psalms, there's a book that's referred to as the Book of Wisdom, which is Proverbs, and you know that that's one of my very favorites. And that's what initially drew me to Psalm 37, and is often the case. The more I read it and the more I prepared, I saw that the content, imagery, and structure of it were designed by David to illustrate that God is always in control. He's in control of his creation, and even when it seems like he isn't. And that all of humanity would be better off by placing their faith, hope, and trust in his system of justice than anything man can dream up. David's faith was in God alone, just like we were just singing. And after considering everything that was going on around him, J.I. Packer summed it up as simply as anybody can. The reason David, I think, could do that was because he knew God. Now, it is infinitely easier to trust somebody you know. Not easy, easier. So, to get us started, I'm going to ask Noah to come up here. Noah, I don't generally do stuff like this, so I, I hope this goes well. Noah, come on. Richard. All right, on the screen, you're going to see what Noah sees. Read for me the words above the word one. Okay, very good. Now, I'm going to turn that over. It's hard to see, but go ahead and read the right there above the F. This note is legal tender for debts, public, and private. Thank you. There, that's for you. <laughs> nope, you got it. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Give me a hand. All right, next screen. <clears throat> Prior to 1971, you could take a dollar bill down to the U.S. Treasury and exchange it for its worth in silver. Did you know that? Since then, nothing backs the, our currency other than the full faith and credit of the United States government. And as I hope to be able to illustrate this morning, we will see that there's a very close relationship between faith, hope, and trust. Now, as those of you who know, uh, the, the six, who lived at the time at least, 
the 60s were a very turbulent time. Almost no one fully trusted the government, which was one of the reasons why our paper currency had been backed by silver. But the trouble with that is, if you want to spend money, you've got to have silver to back it. And the government didn't have enough silver to back all the money they wanted to spend. And so in 1971, the year I graduated high school, that's what they did. They passed that law, and I remember it. And I remember dollar bills looking like the one you saw on the screen. And the law basically said, have faith in us. You can trust the government. Here we are 50 years later, nearly $30 trillion in debt, and not much has changed except for this. Except now we're being told we need to trust the government. As we look at th Psalm 37 this morning, our main question today is this. Who do we really trust? God or the government? Now, I'm not saying who we, who we might say with our mouth we trust. I mean, what does our life look like? Are we living our life day to day in a manner that says that we trust the government more than we trust God? So let's pray and get on with it. Well, Father, I pray that, you, that Psalm 37, in, as the songs that we've just sang were just so inspirational, the Psalms were the songbook for your people, Israel, that was many years ago. And it remains to this day. And these are Psalms to inspire us and to help us to see who you are as God. And I pray, Lord, that you will give me the words that reveal more of you to the folks here this morning, for I ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if any of you are at all like Elizabeth and you've looked ahead, you know that this, is a, this psalm has 40 verses. We can't get through 40 verses. We know that. But here's the good news. I said it was a proverb-like psalm, and as a proverb, you know that you can kind of gra grab little nuggets out of a proverb without having to actually just sit there and, and go through every single one. So let's start with verse 1. Do not be agitated by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong. For they will wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. As John noted last week, and I noted just before, David was older, and by the time he got older, he had amassed a slew of enemies. And by any reckoning whatsoever, his enemies had the upper hand. David did not. So by the time he wrote this, he had a pretty grim outlook on things. He would have, if you know, many of us would. But what was David's response? He wasn't belly aching about his situation or how unfair it was. He affirmed his reliance on the Lord. Look at the beginning of the next three verses with me. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Take delight in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. David's situation was undeniably terrible, but his trust still remained squarely in the Lord. He didn't deny his circumstances either. He understood clearly that his enemies were prospering. In fact, in the Hebrew, in this psalm alone, David uses two words in the Hebrew from which we get evil and wicked 19 times. It was flourishing everywhere he turned. Verse 7. Be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers, by the one who carries out evil plans. Now, this is just one example, and there are several more over the next 13 verses. Notice that those carrying out evil plans are prospering, and in each case, David's response is in proverb-like fashion with something like verse 8, which goes like this. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. 
it can only bring harm. <clears throat> Here we begin to see the man after God's heart, the part of David that most closely resembled what Jesus would be teaching. And we too are going to pivot right here this morning. The verses that immediately come to mind for me when I read verse 8 was Deuteronomy 32, 35. And the reason for that is, is I've been reading through the Old Testament. And you're going to get a, ho a heavy dose of certain things that were very much David's existence. And in Deuteronomy 32, 35, it says, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. And interestingly enough, Paul repeated that exact same verse in Romans 12, 19. Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. Now in Deuteronomy, it goes on to say that same verse, In time, their foot will slip. Now there are your adversaries. For their day of disaster is near, and their doom is coming quickly. And there is part of our challenge with trusting God. We don't know, and a survey of history demonstrates pretty clearly that we never know exactly when God will choose to act. What he considers quickly and when he will balance the ledger, we don't know. Neither did David. But we know this. He always does eventually. In spite of all the evidence to the contrary at the time, at any time in history, God expects his children to trust him, to believe that he's in control, because frankly, if he isn't in control, he isn't God. No matter what happens in the here and now, we either believe he's God in control or we do not. Now, if you find yourself frequently complaining about fairness, justice, I would have you ask yourself this. Is it possible that you have started to trust government more than God? Is your faith in him and your trust reliant on how things are going for you in the here and now? How things are going for your family? How things are going for your country? Trust is a hard thing. It has to be earned. In the mid-20th century, there was a married couple named Erickson, and they published a book on the eight stages of emotional development. Their research suggests that our ability to trust is established in our first two years of life. From then on, everything hoped for will rely on the trustworthiness of our caregiver, and once established, whatever is imprinted in that time period is very difficult to change. Now, you may agree with that or not. However, regardless of however old you are, the, trusty, the trustworthiness of anyone who in which you have placed your care is incredibly influential on your life and the choices you will make. Which then raises another couple of questions. Presuming at some point you placed your faith and hope and trust in Jesus for your salvation, I'll ask you this. How did the first couple of years go immediately after you surrendered your heart to the Lord? I mean, did things go well? Did you expect certain things to happen? Depending on what gospel you were listening to at the time, you could have had an expectation that everything was going to go be sunshine and rainbows once you made a declaration of faith and surrendered. But was that the case? Did your expectations of what you expected God to do for you once you surrendered, did he fail to meet those expectations? Was his care for you lined up the way you thought it ought to have been? I have to tell you, in large measure, once that die is cast, it's hard for it to change. I don't care if you're one year old or you're 50 years old. 
the care you're getting from the people that you trust will greatly impact your choices and who you look to for safety and care. Between, Psalm, between verse 8 and verses 19, David continues to contrast this whole righteousness and the wicked. And then in verse 20, he goes back and paraphrases verse 2. This time it reads like this. But the wicked will perish. The Lord's enemies, like the glories of the pasture, will fade away. They will fade away like smoke. The wicked this, the righteous that. All the way to the very end of this psalm. Verses 39 and 40 David, much the way Solomon summed up Ecclesiastes in, in chapter 12, where if this whole thing of, you know, all is vanity, vanity, and, and on and on it goes in Ecclesiastes, and he comes up to the end, and he just sums it up with one glorious summation. Here now is the old duty of man, trust God and obey his commandments. Pretty simple. Twelve chapters, frankly, of wearing you out on all of the, the things, the trials and travails of life. And therein lies what God, he just lays it down. You're going to trust me or you aren't. Are you going to be obedient or aren't you? And here, it's quite similar actually. Read with me, 39 and 40. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. Their refuge in distress in times of distress, the Lord helps and delivers them. He will deliver them from the wicked and he will save them because they take refuge in him. Their refuge in time of distress. He helps and delivers because they take refuge in him. David concludes this psalm with a summation of the principles that have guided his entire life. These are divinely ordered principles, just like the principles in all of Proverbs. Not necessarily promises, principles. That instead of being overwhelmed by his circumstance, his faith, hope, and trust still rested entirely with God, even though his enemies were prospering and his world was, he was under a great threat. Now, we cannot conclude a look at Psalm 37 without addressing at least the last part of verse 40. This is important to me because it says here, he will deliver them from the wicked and will save them because they take refuge in him. Deliver them doesn't necessarily mean delivery will come immediately or however hard you pray. It doesn't even mean that, it, that the delivery will happen in your lifetime. Just this morning... I was reading, and I'm, I'm reading through the Old Testament, and I'm reading in 2 Kings. And if you want to see a lineup of exactly what God doesn't want from, the, from his leadership, all you have to do is just read through Kings. Because it's king after king after king just being evil and despicable. In the case of Manassas this morning in king, 2 Kings chapter 21... This guy reigned for 55 years from the time he was 12. He reigned 55 years, and according to Scripture, he was worse than anybody before him at that time. 55 years. You know, I think I've been walking this faith walk for a long time because I've been, I, I got saved in 1980. That's 40 years. 55 years, God withheld his judgment. His scale of justice doesn't work on our time clock. Now, I say this a lot, and frankly, it's because even I need to hear it. We live in a fallen world. And there are consequences for that. And as hard as it is to hear, sometimes God chooses to allow certain things to go seemingly unavenged for decades. Seemingly and sometimes for a lifetime. But where faith and trust is that he will balance 
the ledger. Now, Jesus comes along after David, and he is unwavering concerning his enemies and vengeance. He radically challenged even his own disciples, refusing to take up arms against either the Jewish leaders or the Romans. And now some of us struggle with that mightily. I know I do. There are times when you get, really? It's just incredible what you see going on in the country that we love and we, in, the, in the appearance that we are powerless to do anything about it other than our single vote. No matter how compelling it might have been, Jesus never once exercised his right as God's son to dispatch with those who persecuted him with evil intent. Not once. So have you seen the latest series, the, ch the second series of The Chosen? If you haven't, <laughs> really recommend it. But what struck me is, is as I was preparing for this, is Sherry and I watched it a, a couple of weeks ago. And in one of the first two episodes of the second season, the, the, the disciples were walking with Jesus and they came across some Samaritans and they wanted to cut through and the Samaritans didn't receive them very nicely. And this is, this is covered for you in Luke chapter 9 if you want to read the actual scriptural account. And James and John were furious. I mean, they, they weren't named the sons of thunder for nothing. You know, so they were really, really hot. And they turned to Jesus and they just said, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven to consume them? <laughs> and the guy who was playing Jesus just handled it brilliantly. He just shook his head. And, he, and it was kind of funny because, it, you know, he was sort of like, well, we, I still got a long way to go with these guys. And, and he just, you know, no, no. It's really a great scene, by the way. So, you know, when you watch it, you can maybe think about Psalm 37 and David. So John touched on this last week. You see, in the Old Testament, time after time, God's people, including David, the man after God's own heart, asked God to slaughter their enemies. Time after time. I mean, there's, there's you know, two-thirds of your Bible is covered with a whole slew of these people have to be killed, Lord. They're after us. They're terrible. They're despicable. They hate you. They, they, you know, it's on and on. Jesus comes along and he turns it all on its ear because what God always wanted came into clear focus when Jesus came and said, no. And then he had Paul remind us that, remember that whole bit about Deuteronomy? Vengeance is whose? The Father. Jesus deferred to the Father. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, no matter what's happening within our country, no matter what the government decides, Jesus, no matter what the Romans decided, Jesus always did what? Went about his father's business. Did he not? Isn't that what Scripture says over and over? That that's what Jesus did. No matter what was going on, no matter how bad the whirlwind, that was what Jesus focused on. My father's business. How did he know that? Jesus expects us to love our neighbor. A couple few years ago, John came up in January and said, this year... We're going to focus on loving our neighbor. One of the things we really didn't spend any time with is, is what if your neighbor's really horrible? I mean, you know, it's the luck of the draw because you can't control who moves in next to you, and they could be wretched. They could be slobs. They could be terrible. They could hate God. They can hate you. Jesus' enemies hated him. Jesus' own people the leadership of his own people hated him. And he radically stood in defiance of them and said, not the way my father sees this. Not, the what, not what my father expects. In verse 19, it says, vengeance is mine. But right before it, 
there's this really cool verse which says, if possible on your part, live at peace with everyone. Is that easy? Remember, I said easier when you trust the Lord. I said not easy. Depending on your personality type, this could be a real leap. So how do we do this? I wasn't quite sure how I was going to wrap this up in trying to be inspirational because I don't want us to get too, you know, yes, you look around and it's disturbing. The things that are going on and the manner in which our country is so divided is disturbing. But how can we have a faith, hope, and trust takeaway? And in our staff meeting on Monday, John read a devotional earlier, and we were back in 12. He was in Romans chapter 12. We read the entire chapter 12 together on Monday, and it was that right there for me. This is where you land the plane, right? It's... It, if we had the time, we would read the entire chapter. But the, we're going to look at certain bits this morning because the, the section between verses 9 and verses 21 is all about living with a Christian ethic. Now, we don't have to go into a scholastic deal about what an ethic is and how does that differ from morality. Just, just put it under this umbrella. It's how do you go about making your moral choices? On what basis do you decide what you consider morally right, morally wrong. How's that? We'll just leave it at that. I won't get all academic, which, frankly, I'm not really even skilled enough to do that. Romans 12. We're going to read some of 9 through 21 for some inspiration here as we wrap this up. Love must be without hypocrisy. Well, there's a good place to start. Be genuine. Keep it real. Detest evil. It's okay to detest evil, by the way. You don't have to sit there and put lipstick all over it. Evil's evil. Do what is good. Rejoice in hope. Patient in affliction. Persistent in prayer. Share with your fellow believers. Be hospitable. Bless those who persecute you. What? I don't want to do that. Of course you don't. Do not repay evil for evil. Do what is honorable to who? Honorable based on who's calling the shots, God or government. Well, now we're getting into it. Do not be conquered by evil, but evil conquer evil with good. If David had lived to see and meet Jesus, I have little doubt that those principles that you just heard there would have been included in Psalm 37 because it's that kind of psalm. It's the psalm that acknowledges that things can be going really bad for really long periods of time. And you can have your enemies prospering all around you. And yet God calls you into trusting him. Now as we do each week, we're going to go into the head, heart, hand. Head. I would like for you to read Psalm 37. And then immediately read Romans chapter 12. But I don't want you to change, finish at the end of Romans chapter 12. Just two more verses. Go to 13.2 for me. Okay? Psalm 37, Romans chapter 12 through 13.2. And then ask yourself our question of today. Is my trust in God or the government? Be as honest with yourself as you can be. And if you're really unsure after you've asked yourself, ask another couple of questions. Who has let you down in your life? Do you, do you think God has let you down? You might. Why? On what basis are you evaluating God's trustworthiness in your life? For some of you, that might be a pretty important thing to get resolved. Heart, remind yourself that God is God and you are not. We are not God. Faith, hope, and trust are somewhat of an emotional trinity. And what I mean by it like that is the Holy Trinity, like the Holy Trinity, are different each person. So are faith, hope, and trust 
But here's the unique thing. Just like the Trinity, you can't have one without the other two. Now think about that. Now when your trust gets wobbly, because it can, and for any reason, Sherry shared with me something that she does that I felt was pretty powerful and I want to share with you. When she is shaken, she reminds herself of God's attributes. Now, what are God's attributes? These are the things that make up God's character. She reminds herself of his holiness. She reminds herself of his inexhaustible grace and mercy. Of his power and his omnipotence. There are many more, but they all remind us that God is God. And we are not. As J.I. Packer noted, David knew God, and that made all the difference in his life. Not knowing about him. Some of us talk to God. Well, you can talk to the TV, too. That doesn't mean anything, really. You know, it's, 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 are you talking with someone? You have to know him, not about him. Now, none of us knows the government. But we can know God. And there's only one way I know to get to know someone, and that is to spend time with them. Which leads me to hands. This is Romans 12, 12 here. Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, and persist in prayer. Hands. Those are things that you can do. So how do we live out Romans 12, 12? I know I'm a broken record on this, and it's almost every single time I'm up here, but from a scriptural standpoint, I'm not aware of any shortcuts. If you want to do anything in life better, what do you have to do? Work at it, don't you? I mean, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm an Olympic sprinter today. I'm going to pass the time trial. Of course you're not. You have to work at it. And therefore, if it's something that you you say, I care, I mean, I'm going to talk to you about for me personally. I wanted to be a better Christian for the first 20 years of my faith walk. But I didn't spend a terrible amount of time beyond Sunday and Wednesday Just being real, you know? And I was wondering why, you know, I'm still kind of treading water. I wasn't gaining much in the way in the ground. And then I started praying. And at first it was really ugly and and, and awkward, and and I felt weird and, and, and all of that. But I started simply. And that's my encouragement to you, to start simply. If you don't have a Bible... You probably have access to a computer or your your phone. Just Google the Lord's Prayer and read the Luke version if I could recommend one over the other. And I would say, don't just read it. No. Read one line and then pause for long enough to reflect upon it and, and and ask the Lord to reveal to you what difference that one line should make in my life. From the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry right up into the Garden of Gethsemane, Scripture records that Jesus separated himself to pray time after time. Why wouldn't we do what he did? That's the question. So summing up, faith, hope, and trust, trust never get easier, but they will I'm sorry, they never get easy. They get easier the better you know your caregiver. Prayer is how Jesus stayed in constant contact with his Father. And as the world around us gets more challenging as believers, the best way to remain faithful to our calling is to spend less time listening to the world around us and more time praying and seeking to know the God of our salvation. Let's pray.
there's no denying, Lord, that there's a lot of stuff that's going on in, in, in our country and around the world that is, that is very disturbing and is not the way we, as your children, would like to see our world. I mean, it's just the way it is. But we, we trust you, we love you, and we place ourselves in your care. And we will keep turning to you no matter how bright or dark the days, so long as we stay focused on doing exactly what Jesus did, and that's praying for your guidance. We ask it all in his name. Amen.